California Air Resources Board's webinar on the Zero Emission Vehicle Regulation. My name is Ian Colletti and I am an Air Resources Engineer at ARB. Today I will be taking you through a detailed look at California's ZEV regulation for 2018 and subsequent model year vehicles. I have a few announcements before we proceed. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date. You will receive an email message notifying you when it has been posted on our ZEV program webpage. Today's presentation is expected to last approximately one hour and ten minutes, after which there will be a short and question and answer portion. Please submit all questions to the chat box on the GoToWebinar control panel. We will answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. We will also post written responses to the questions as a Q&A document on ARB's Dev program webpage. We will now begin the tutorial starting with a brief overview on the ZEV regulation. The Air Resources Board has been a leader in developing the Air Resources Board has been a leader in developing programs designed to reduce emissions from mobile sources. California is a large state with millions of vehicles, millions of drivers, and millions of gallons of fuel consumed daily. The ZEV regulation is a key program needed to meet California's health-based air quality standards. It is also recognized that widespread adoption of ZEVs will be necessary to meet California's greenhouse gases or GHG reduction goals. In 2012, the California Air Resources Board passed comprehensive modifications to the ZEV regulation. These modifications primarily affect 2018 and subsequent model year vehicles. In addition to simplifying the regulation, these modifications substantially increase requirements. This presentation is intended to take you through the requirements established under these modifications. We are going to start with a quick overview of how the regulation works. The ZEV regulation sets ZEV credit percentage requirements based on a manufacturer's average annual, annual sales volume. Manufacturers meet their requirement with credits earned through the introduction and sale of zero emission vehicles, or ZEVs. The ZEV regulation also sets spending rules on how credits earned from each of the different vehicle technologies may be used in meeting a manufacturer's annual requirement. Obviously, this is a very high level overview, but it is important to keep in mind as we discuss the regulation. Before we get into the regulation in detail, we are going to need to cover some background and we will start with the Section 177 ZEV states. Given that California established air quality rules before the Federal Clean Air Act was adopted and has challenging air quality problems, California is allowed to adopt its own emission standards as long as they either meet or exceed the federal requirement. Section 177 of the Clean Air Act allows states that have similar air quality issues to also adopt California's standards. Currently, nine Section 177 ZEV states have adopted California's ZEV regulation, which are represented on this slide. These states have also adopted California's Low Emission Vehicle, or LEV, regulations, making them Section 177 LEV states, along with additional LEV states that have not adopted the ZEV regulation. As a result of adopting California's ZEV regulation, each of these states has an individual ZEV requirement that manufacturers must meet with ZEVs placed in each of those individual states. Now that we have a general understanding of the regulation, let's start by looking at a manufacturer's volume status and what that means in terms of its ZEV requirements. If you want to sell car cars in California, you are going to need to figure out what size manufacturer you are, otherwise known as a manufacturer's volume status. Volume status is described in the definition section, section 1900 of the LEV regulation. Volume status is based on a manufacturer's average California sales of passenger cars, light duty trucks, and medium duty vehicles produced and delivered for sale for the three previous consecutive model years. I have underlined the word California because even though manufacturers have individual requirements in each of the section 177 ZEV states, a manufacturer's volume status is always based on its average California sales volume. A company that has average California sales of less than 4,500 vehicles is considered a small volume manufacturer or SVM. 
a company with average sales between 4,500 and 20,000 vehicles is considered an intermediate volume manufacturer, or IVM. Finally, a company with average sales greater than 20,000 vehicles is considered a large volume manufacturer, or LVM. Volume status matters because it lets you know if your company is subject to the regulation. Small volume manufacturers are not subject to the regulation, whereas intermediate and large volume manufacturers are. While the definition of a manufacturer's volume status is defined in the definitions of the LEV regulation, how a manufacturer transitions between volume status is defined within the ZEV regulation. Starting in 2018 model year, any small volume manufacturer with average California sales exceeding 4,500 vehicles will become an intermediate volume manufacturer. This average sales volume remains unchanged from previous regulatory requirements. However, the calculation, which was previously based on the average of the three previous model years, will now be based on three consecutive three-year averages. In order for an intermediate volume manufacturer to transition to a large volume manufacturer, the company will need average California sales greater than 20,000 vehicles based on five consecutive three-year averages. In addition, a global revenue test has been added for intermediate volume manufacturers in 2018, 2019, and 2020 model years only. This test allows an intermediate volume manufacturer to exclude 2018, 2019, and 2020 production data over 20,000 from its consecutive count should its global revenue not exceed $40 billion in any of those model years for the purposes of determining its volume status. For all manufacturers, a decrease in volume status is based on three consecutive three-year averages. The increase or decrease in volume status will be effective in the following model year. Let's take a look at how this calculation works in a little more detail. Here we see the example of an intermediate volume manufacturer that is transitioning to a large volume manufacturer. Remember, we are looking for five consecutive three-year averages of 20,000 or more. Starting in model year 2018, the first set of three year averages that will be considered for transition and volume status will be the annual sales associated with the 2015 through 2017 model years. For model year 2018 compliance, this manufacturer has average California sales greater than 20,000. As a result, model year 2018 would be the first year that would be counted toward the five consecutive three year averages needed to transition to large volume manufacturer status. This manufacturer would be on track to transition in model year 2023. However, this is the revenue test is applied. The global revenue test, the global revenue for this manufacturer does not exceed $40 billion in model year 2018. As a result, this manufacturer may exclude model year 2018 from its consecutive count. This manufacturer will continue to have average California sales in excess of 20,000 and a global revenue exceeding $40 billion in model year 2019, making this the first year that will now count toward the five consecutive three-year averages needed for transition. According to this chart, this manufacturer will continue to have a global revenue greater than $40 billion in 2020, the last year for the global revenue test, and will also have average California sales greater than 20,000 vehicles in 2020 through 2023 model years. As a result, this manufacturer will now be subject to large volume manufacturer requirements starting in model year 2024. Now that we know how volume status is determined, we will talk about how to calculate a manufacturer's production volume in which their ZEV requirement is applied. The ZEV regulation refers to this as calculating the number of vehicles to which the percentage ZEV requirement is applied. However, for the purposes of this presentation, we will simply refer to this as production volume. This is the production volume on which your ZEV percentage requirement will be based and will be used to calculate the number of ZEV credits your company must produce, produce in compliance with the regulation. This is a different calculation method from what is used to determine your company's volume status. Let's take a look at how this is calculated for 2018 and subsequent model year compliance. 
The calculation of production volume is based on a manufacturer's average sales of passenger cars and light-duty vehicles. Please note that starting in 2018 model year compliance, a manufacturer will be required to include the number of ZEVs produced for a given model year. Prior to 2018, manufacturers had a choice on how production volume is calculated within each state every model year. Starting in 2018, manufacturers are required to use production volume data from the second, third, and fourth previous model years. As an example, your 2018 model year production volume calculation will be based on your 2014 through 2016 model year sales. A manufacturer will no longer have the option of choosing its calculation method. However, a manufacturer may apply to ARB's executive officer to request to use the same year method should they experience a drop in California production by at least 30% due to circumstances beyond its control. Manufacturers may only use this method two times between 2018 and 2025 model years. As an example, if a manufacturer saw the number of vehicles produced and delivered for sale in 2018 model year drop by more than 30% from their 2017 model year sales due to unforeseeable circumstances, it would be allowed to use model year 2018 sales as its production volume for that model year. Before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to remind you to please submit all questions to the chat window within the GoToWebinar control panel. We have reviewed volume status and production volume, so you know whether you are subject to the regulation and the basis for calculating your requirement. Next, we are going to look at the ZEV credit percentage requirement. Here you can see an overview of the ZEV credit percentage requirements for 2018 and subsequent model years. One of the biggest changes introduced as part of the regulatory amendments made in 2012 is that starting in model year 2018, the total requirement will climb by 2.5% every year until it reaches 22% for 2025 model year and beyond. By creating an increasingly stringent production requirement that manufacturers must meet through the introduction of ZEVs, the ZEV regulation helps to drive down the cost and accelerate the development of the cleanest new vehicles. The key to the regulation is that these are ZEV percentage credit requirements as opposed to vehicle production requirements. Manufacturers are allowed to earn credits from the production of a variety of different vehicle technologies and depending on volume status have flexibility in how they choose to meet the requirement. Before we get into how a manufacturer may meet the requirement, we are going to talk about the different vehicles that may earn ZEV credits. In order for a manufacturer to meet the ZEV requirement percentages I have laid out for you, they're going to need to generate credits by producing eligible vehicles. Before we discuss credits, I need to clarify that there is technically only one type of credit, ZEV credits. There are several types of vehicles that are eligible to earn credits. We will first discuss zero emission vehicles, or ZEVs, then talk about transitional zero emission vehicles, or TZEVs. There are three additional types of vehicles that are eligible to earn credits, but these vehicles are not as commonly produced. There are hydrogen internal combustion engine or HICE vehicles, range extended battery electric vehicles or BEVXs, and finally neighborhood electric vehicles or NETs. Even though there is only one type of credit, there are spending rules associated with the credits earned from each of the different vehicle technologies. As a shorthand, people tend to refer to these credits by the name of the vehicle type on which they were earned. Prior to 2018 model year compliance, manufacturers were, are also allowed to earn credits for the cleanest internal combustion engine vehicles, called PZEVs, and also from standard non-plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, called ATPZEVs. Starting in 2018 model year, these vehicles will no longer be eligible to earn credits for meeting a manufacturer's requirement under the ZEV regulation. Starting in 2018 model year, credits for vehicles are significantly simplified, as you will see, and the per vehicle credit value is based entirely on vehicle range and power. This graph provides an overview of the overall credit structure for model year 2018 and beyond. The blue line represents credit values for ZEVs, and these green lines represent credits for TZEVs. As you can see, 
credits for vehicles are awarded in a consistent manner using an equation that directly rewards vehicles for incremental increases in range and performance. Let's start by looking at credits for ZEVs. In order to qualify as a ZEV, the vehicle must produce zero exhaust emissions of any criteria pollutant or greenhouse gas under any and all possible operational modes. The two types of ZEVs on the road today are battery electric vehicles, or BEVs, and fuel cell electric vehicles, or FCEVs. It is easy to calculate the per vehicle credit value for ZEVs because it's based entirely on the electric range of the vehicle. The per vehicle ZEV credit value is based on the vehicle's all electric range, or AER, as determined on the UDDS test cycle. The AER is determined using the urban all-electric range test, as outlined in the California Exhaust Emissions and Test Procedures for 2018 and subsequent model year vehicles. This test measures the vehicle's total charge depleting range based on the UDDS test cycle. The AER lets you know if a ZEV qualifies for credits, and if so, how many. Vehicles with an AER less than 50 miles will not qualify for ZEV credits, for vehicles with an AER greater than 50 miles, the per vehicle credit value will be based on this equation. Don't be confused by the UDDS referenced in this equation. It is the same as the all electric range or AER used above. Vehicles that exceed an AER of 350 miles on the UDDS test cycle receive the maximum of four credits per vehicle. Prior to model year 2018, credits were awarded for both delivery and placement. Manufacturers earn one credit for delivery when the vehicle is delivered for sale to the dealer and the remainder of the credit balance when the vehicle is placed or sold to a customer. Starting in 2018, manufacturers earn credits when vehicles are delivered for sale and are no longer required to prove placement in order to earn credits. In addition, prior to 2018 model year, ZEVs could earn additional credits if they were capable of refueling at a rate analogous to gasoline vehicles. This is commonly referred to as fast refueling, and it will no longer be applicable to ZEVs model year 2018 and beyond. The next slide will give you a better idea of the number of credits that a vehicle can earn based on range. I want to highlight a few current ZEVs in order to show you how many credits they would earn under this new credit structure for 2018 and subsequent model year vehicles. For example, the current 2016 model year Nissan LEAF with the larger 30 kilowatt hour battery pack has an EPA label range of approximately 107 miles. This vehicle has an AER of approximately 160 miles on the UDDS test cycle and it earns three credits per vehicle. If this vehicle continues to be sold with the current AER of 160 miles in model year 2018 and beyond, it will earn approximately two ZEV credits per vehicle. The current 2015 Hyundai Tucson fuel cell has an EPA label range of 265 miles and an AER of approximately 360 miles and is eligible to earn nine credits per vehicle. If this current configuration is sold in 2018 and beyond, it will earn the maximum of four credits per vehicle. As I'm sure many of you are aware, a number of manufacturers have announced plans to reduce ZEVs with at least 200 miles of range on a single charge. If we look at the mileage figures for the LEAF and Tucson, we see that the EPA label range is approximately 70% of the UDDS test range. If we assume this same percentage for a ZEV with a label range of 200 miles, we can assume these vehicles will earn approximately three credits per vehicle. Let's move on to credits for TZEVs. The most common types of transitional zero emission vehicles, or TZEVs, are plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, or PHEVs. PHEVs are capable of traveling purely on electric power, but also use an internal combustion engine that enables charge-sustaining hybrid operation once the electric system is mostly depleted. <clears throat> 
In order for a TZEV to be eligible to earn credits, it must meet SULEV emission standards and have zero evaporative emissions. In addition, they must come with a 15-year, 150,000-mile extended emissions warranty and a 10-year, 150,000-mile warranty on the vehicle's traction battery used for hybrid electric operation. TZEVs earn credits primarily through the zero emission vehicle miles traveled TZEV allowance, also known as the zero emission VMT TZEV allowance. There is another type of TZEV called a hydrogen internal combustion engine or HICE vehicle. As the name implies, these vehicles are similar to traditional gasoline powered ICEs. However, they use hydrogen in place of gasoline. We will discuss HICE vehicles in detail later. But for now, let's look at the VMT TZEV allowance. Just as with the calculation of credits for pure ZEVs, we first apply a range criteria based on the vehicle's AER to determine eligibility for the zero emission VMT TZEV allowance. Vehicles with an AER less than 10 miles do not qualify to earn credits. For vehicles with an AER greater than 10 miles, the per vehicle credit value is determined by this equation. Unlike the calculation for credits for pure ZEVs, which uses the AER for this credit calculation, TZEVs use the equivalent all-electric range, or EAER, which is determined by the urban equivalent all-electric range test outlined in section G11 of the exhaust emission test procedures. Finally, vehicles with an AER greater than 80 miles earn 1.1 credit. In addition, each vehicle capable of achieving at least 10 miles of all electric range on the US 06 drive cycle are eligible to earn additional 0.2 credits per vehicle. The US 06 test cycle is more aggressive than the UDDS test cycle and simulates real world urban driving. In order to give you a little more context, let's take a look at the possible credits a vehicle could earn under the zero emission VMT TZEV allowance. For vehicles with an AER between 10 and 80 miles, the credit values are based on the equation I showed you on the previous page. These vehicles can earn between 0.4 credits up to the credit cap of 1.1 credits. For example, the 2016 model year Hyundai Sonata PHEV is an example of a current TZEV that would fall within the, this credit range for 2018 and beyond. Vehicles that are capable of achieving at least 10 miles AER on the more aggressive US 06 drive cycle are represented by the blue and green line. These vehicles are capable of earning an additional 0.2 credits each for a total VMT TZEV allowance of 1.3 credits per vehicle. The 2016 model year Chevrolet Volt is a good example of a current TZEV that has the type of strong hybrid electric system that would qualify within this credit range for model year 2018 and beyond. Next, we will take a look at credit values for HICE vehicles. HICE vehicles that are capable of a total range of at least 250 miles on the UDDS test cycle qualify to earn a base of 0.75 credits. HICE vehicles that also incorporate electrified powertrain components enabling at least 10 miles of all electric range are eligible to earn additional credits via the zero emission VMT TZEV allowance previously discussed. Any credits HICE vehicles earn from the VMT TZEV allowance are added to the base 0.75 credits and are subject to an overall cap of 1.25 credits per vehicle. There are currently no manufacturers that have announced plans to produce this type of vehicle. Next, we're going to look at a few additional vehicles that earn ZEV credits. We will start with looking at the Range Extended Battery Electric Vehicle, or BEV-X. The BEV-X is a unique vehicle that has elements of both BEV and TZEV. These vehicles operate primarily as ZEVs. However, they are also equipped with an onboard engine called an Auxiliary Power Unit, or APU. The APU is designed to operate only when the traction battery has been fully depleted, and it cannot provide more range than the battery electric powertrain alone. The APU must pass all of the same emissions and warranty requirements as TZEVs. 
These vehicles earn credits based on the same equation that other ZEVs use. However, unlike BEVs, which must have a minimum AER of 50 miles, a BEVX must have a, an AER of at least 75 miles. Unlike BEVX, our next vehicle type earns a fixed credit value. NEVs, or Neighborhood Electric Vehicles, are smaller vehicles with a top speed of 25 miles per hour and can only travel on streets with up to 35 miles per hour posted speed limit. NEVs earn a flat 0.15 credits per vehicle. Over the years, we have added some technological requirements to ensure that only the most full-functioning NEVs earn ZEV credits. These include acceleration, top speed, and constant speed range requirements. In addition, NEVs must be equipped with a sealed, maintenance-free battery and must come with a 24-month warranty. Next, we're going to discuss some additional credits that manufacturers can use in meeting their ZEV percentage requirements for 2018 and subsequent model years. We're going to start with bank credits from partial zero-emission vehicles, or PZEVs, and advanced technology PZEVs, or ATPZEVs. Prior to 2018 model years, manufacturers were allowed to earn credits for the cleanest internal combustion engine vehicles, called PZEVs, and also from standard non-plug-in hybrid electric vehicles called PZEVs, called ATPZEVs. Starting in model year 2018, manufacturers will no longer be able to earn credits for these types of vehicles. Manufacturers will be allowed to use bank credits earned prior to 2018 model year to meet their 2018 through 2025 model year compliance. However, at the end of 2017 model year compliance, the credits will be discounted by the amount listed in the chart. Next, we will take a look at advanced technology demonstration programs. This provision allows manufacturers to earn credits for vehicles placed as prototypes. These vehicles can be kept within the company to do extensive testing or passed along to customers to determine consumer acceptance. These vehicles do not need to be delivered for sale or registered with the DMV. In order to earn credits, vehicles must be in the Advanced Demonstration Program for at least two years and must be in California at least 50% of the time. We have limited this provision to 25 vehicles per model per state per year. Credits for Advanced Technology Demonstration Programs are calculated in the same way as all credits for pure ZEVs, and once these credits are earned, they may be used in the same manner as other ZEV credits. Next, we are going to take a look at a different type of credit that is new for model year 2018 compliance. Starting in 2018 model year, manufacturers may offset a portion of their model year 2018 through 2021 ZEV credit percentage requirements through the use of GHG ZEV over compliance credits. GHG ZEV overcompliance is designed to reward manufacturers that consistently comply with their fleet average GHG standard. Manufacturers must submit notification in writing to ARB's executive officer by no later than December 31, 2016 if they wish to earn these credits. In order to become eligible for GHG ZEV overcompliance credits, a manufacturer must meet three preconditions. A manufacturer must have no outstanding compliance debts under the ZEV regulation and must have no outstanding GHG program debts for 2017 or any previous model year compliance. Additionally, a manufacturer must submit product plan documentation sufficient to demonstrate projected overcompliance with the manufacturer's fleet average GHG program requirements by at least 2 grams CO2 per mile in each model year from 2018 through 2021. Next, we will look at how a manufacturer earns these credits. Once a manufacturer is eligible, it must show every year an overcompliance of at least 2 grams CO2 per mile with their previous model year's GHG program requirements. The credit calculation is based on the amount that the manufacturer has overcomplied with the previous model year's requirements. In other words, in order to calculate a manufacturer's 2018 overcompliance credits, a manufacturer would use its 27 model year compliance data. Let's take a look at how these credits are calculated. In order to calculate GHG ZEV overcompliance credits, we start with a manufacturer's total U.S. passenger car and light duty truck sales for a given model year. 
This is then multiplied by the amount that a manufacturer has overcomplied with its GHG fleet average program requirement in that same model year. That value is divided by the manufacturer's GHG program requirement for the same model year. While the basic equation for the calculation of GHG ZEV overcompliance credits is located within the ZEV regulation, the calculation of the manufacturer's GHG program requirements is located within LEV3 regulation. Next, I want to look at this calculation in more detail, starting with the manufacturer fleet average GHG standard. First, you will need to calculate the CO2 target value for each unique model type and vehicle footprint combination that a manufacturer produces in a given model year. Target values can be found under California's greenhouse gas e exhaust emission standards within the LEV3 regulation, California Code of Regulations, Title 13, 1961.3. Each vehicle's CO2 target value is then multiplied by the total production volume of that vehicle type and footprint combination for the applicable model year. The resulting products are then summed and divided by the manufacturer's total production volume of passenger cars and light duty trucks and medium duty vehicles to get the manufacturer's fleet average GHG standard for a given model year. A manufacturer must include ZEVs when calculating this value. Next, we must figure out how much you have over complied with this standard. In order to calculate a manufacturer's overcompliance, we start with the manufacturer's fleet average GHG standard that we reviewed on the previous slide and subtract from it the manufacturer's fleet average GHG value of that same model year. This calculation uses the GHG emissions values for each model vehicle measured on specific test cycles. The city CO2 is based on the FTP test cycle, and the highway CO2 is based on the highway fuel economy test cycle. Again, ZEVs must be included in this calculation in order to account for upstream emissions resulting from energy generation or hydrogen production. There are additional equations that you will use to calculate those emissions values. I won't go into these calculations in too much detail, but I have included them for reference. You can see that there are specific equations that must be used to calculate the emissions for both BEVs and fuel cell electric vehicles. In case there are any questions regarding the calculation of GHG ZEV over compliance credits, I would like to take a moment to remind you to please submit questions to the GoToWebinar questions box on the left of the screen. Now that we know how to to earn credits from a variety of vehicles and compliance mechanisms, we need to know the spending rules associated with credits from different vehicle types in meeting your ZEV percentage requirements. Here again is the basic ZEV credit percentage requirements for model year 2018 and beyond. The ZEV regulation lists, lists these as the percentage of a manufacturer's average production volume that must be met with ZEV credits. As we have discussed, there are several types of vehicles that earn credits. Next, we are going to cover the spending rules associated with each of the different credit types based on a manufacturer's volume status, starting with the requirements for large volume manufacturers. For a large volume manufacturer, this graph shows the portion of a manufacturer's total ZEV credit requirement that can be met with credits from different vehicle types. For example, the blue bars represent the portion of a large volume manufacturer's requirement that must be met with credits from pure ZEVs, otherwise known as the minimum ZEV floor. The green bars represent the portion of a large volume manufacturer's requirement that may be met with credits from TZEVs. To be clear, this is not a TZEV requirement. A manufacturer could choose to meet their entire requirement with credits from pure ZEVs. As always, there is an additional flexibility given to smaller volume manufacturers. In this example, we have a large volume manufacturer with an annual average production volume of 100,000 vehicles for model year 2018. The total ZEV percentage credit requirement for model year 2018 is 4.5%, of which 2% must be met with ZEV credits and 2.5% may be met with credits from TZEVs. 
As a result, this manufacturer will need at least 2,000 ZEB credits and may use a maximum of 2,500 credits from TZEBs to meet a portion of their requirements. This manufacturer produces two vehicles that are eligible to earn ZEB credits. The first is a ZEV with an AER greater than 350 miles that earns the maximum of four credits per vehicle. The second is a TZEV that earns approximately 0.8 credits per vehicle. As a result, this manufacturer would need to produce at least 500 ZEVs and could produce a maximum of 3,000 125 TZEVs in order to meet their requirements. This manufacturer could choose to produce all ZEVs, the ability to meet a portion of their requirement with credits from TZEVs is a flexibility. As always, there are additional flexibilities given to small volume manufacturers. IBMs are allowed to meet their entire ZEV credit percentage requirements with credits from TZEVs. Again, a manufacturer, an intermediate volume manufacturer, could choose to only produce ZEVs in order to meet their requirements. This is a flexibility that they have in meeting their total ZEV credit percentage requirements. Next, we are going to look at some other rules that manufacturers can use in meeting their requirements. Before we get into specifics on credit usage, here are some general rules. You can produce as many credits of each vehicle category as you want. These credits can be banked for future use. Credits may be traded or sold to any other party. Before you ask, no, we don't know what a ZEV credit is worth or how much one costs. A, tra a traded credit works just the same as if you yourself produce and place the vehicle. None of these spending rules are applicable to GHG ZEV over compliance credits, which we will cover next. Earlier, we talked about GHG ZEV over compliance credits. There are rules that dictate how a manufacturer may use these credits to meet its ZEV requirement. First, these credits may only be used in the model year they were earned, meaning they cannot be banked or carried back to meet other model years compliance. Any credits that are used to calculate GHG ZEV over compliance credits must be removed from the manufacturer's GHG compliance bank and cannot be used for future compliance towards its LEV3 or National GHG program requirements. The manufacturer may only use these credits to meet the portion of its overall requirement as is listed in the table. These caps are on the percentage of a manufacturer's total ZEV requirement and the percentage of a manufacturer's minimum ZEV floor that may be met with GHG ZEV over compliance credits. These credits cannot be traded to another manufacturer for compliance. Let's take a look at how this credit cap works in a little more detail. Here again, we have a large volume manufacturer with an average production volume of 100,000 vehicles for model year 2018. As you know from our previous spending example, the total ZEV percentage requirement for 2018 model year is 4.5%, meaning that this manufacturer must use 2,000 credits from ZEVs and may use up to 2,500 credits from TZEVs. Given that there is a 50% cap on the minimum ZEV floor and a 50% cap on the total ZEV credit requirement for GHG ZEV over compliance credits, this manufacturer can reduce its ZEV specific ZEV requirement to 1% and the portion of its requirement that may be met with credits from TZEVs by 1.25%, reducing its total ZEV requirement that must be met with credits from vehicles to 2.25%. As a result, this manufacturer will now only need 1,000 credits from pure ZEVs and 1,250 credits from TZEVs. In total, this manufacturer will be able to use 2,250 credits from GHG ZEV over compliance to meet their overall ZEV requirement. I'm sure that there are additional questions related to this type of credit. Understanding how these credits may be spent is important because there are other types of credits that we will look at next that have the same spending restriction. We're going to go over some spending caps 
that limit how credits earned from specific vehicle types may be used on a given portion of a manufacturer's requirement in a given model year. You should notice that the boxes are color-coded based on the portion of the requirement towards which credits earned from each of the vehicle types may be spent. The blue boxes represent a cap on either a manufacturer's total ZEV requirement or the portion of the requirement that must be met with ZEV credits, otherwise known as the minimum ZEV floor. The green boxes represent caps on the portion of a manufacturer's requirement that may be met with credits from TZEVs. First, we will start with credits earned from BEVXs. Credits earned from BEVXs are only allowed to meet half of the manufacturer's minimum ZEV floor. Notice that there is no restriction on how these credits can be used in meeting a manufacturer's requirement that may be met with credits from TZEVs. Next are the caps on GHG ZEV overcompliance credits. I know that we just went over these in detail, but I wanted to show you how these credit caps relate to credit caps, to other credit caps. Prior to 2018 model year, manufacturers were allowed to earn credit for vehicles placed as part of a transportation system program. These were credits awarded in addition to the vehicle's base ZEV credit for vehicles that were placed as part of innovative transportation system programs. While manufacturers will no longer be allowed to earn credits from transportation system programs, they will be allowed to use banked credits to meet a portion of their requirement for 2018 and subsequent model year compliance. Transportation system credits earned from ZEVs, or ZEV TFCs as they're listed in the chart, may be used to meet up to one-tenth of a manufacturer's total ZEV requirement, and may only be used to meet up to one-tenth of a manufacturer's ZEV-specific ZEV requirement in any given model year. This credit cap is similar to that of GHG ZEV overcompliance credits, where there is a cap on the manufacturer's total ZEV percentage requirement, but also on a portion of the manufacturer's ZEV-specific ZEV requirement. Transportation system credits earned for TZEVs, or TZEV TSCs as they're listed in the chart, can be used to meet up to one-tenth of a manufacturer's ZEV requirement that may be met with TZEV credits. In addition to these individual caps, there is an overall cap on the use of credits earned from GHG ZEV over compliance, transportation systems, and BEVX placement. Collectively, these credits will only be allowed to meet up to 50% of a manufacturer's minimum ZEV floor for any given model year. Earlier in the presentation, we discussed the fact that any banked PZEV or ATPZEV credits a manufacturer has after model year 2017 compliance will be discounted. Credits earned from these types of vehicles, along with credits earned from NEVs, are limited in how they may be used in meeting a manufacturer's requirement. As you can see, these credits will will be allowed to meet 100% of an intermediate volume manufacturer's requirement in model years 2018 and 2019, and then 25% of an intermediate volume manufacturer's requirement in 2020 through 2025 model years. For large volume manufacturers, these credits will be allowed to meet 25% of a manufacturer's requirement that may be met with credits from TZEVs for 2018 through 2025 model year compliance. Next, we are going to look at flexibilities built into the regulation relating to compliance outside of California. First, we will discuss the travel provision. We use the term travel provision as a shorthand. However, in the ZEV regulation, this subsection is, is located under a title. This subsection is entitled, Counting Specified ZEVs Placed in a Section 177 State and in California. This is important to point out because there is a lot of misconception around this provision that results from using the term travel. So what exactly is travel? Travel allows a manufacturer that earns credits in California or any Section 177 state to also earn credits in every other state at a proportional value. Starting in 2018 model year, only credits from fuel cell electric vehicles will be allowed to travel. Credits from BEVs will no longer be allowed to travel in 2018 model year and beyond. Once credits are traveled, they cannot be traveled again. Credits travel at a proportional value that is calculated as a ratio of the manufacturer's Section 177 state sales to the manufacturer's California sales. 
a manufacturer without a requirement cannot participate in travel. Let's take a closer look at how this works. Using the term travel is confusing because the credits don't actually travel anywhere. That is to say, the credits don't actually leave a manufacturer's account in one state and then travel to their account in, in another state. Before we can understand travel, we must first understand the proportional value calculation. Let's say your company has a total average production volume of 1,000 vehicles in California, 75,000 vehicles in state A, 50,000 in state B, and 25,000 in state C. The proportional val value is simply the ratio of your average production volume in each state to California's production volume. This means that the proportional value for traveling credits is 100% in California, 75% in state A, 50% in state B, and 25% in state C. In our example, your company produces a fuel cell electric vehicle that earns the maximum of four credits per vehicle. If you were to sell 1,000 vehicles in California, you would have 4,000 ZEV credits. Let's say you chose to travel all 4,000 of those credits from your California bank. As a result, you would keep those 4,000 credits in California. In addition, you would also earn 3,000 credits in state A, 2,000 credits in state B, and 1,000 credits in state C. One important thing to note is that as a result of travel, you earn these credits in all of the four states. You don't just choose one state to receive the traveled credits. Now let's say that instead of earning the credits in California, you sold all 1,000 vehicles in state B, and you chose to travel the resulting 4,000 credits from that state. As a result, you would still earn 4,000 credits in California, 3,000 credits in State A, 2,000 credits in State B, and 1,000 credits in State C. Notice that the value of the credits in each state is the same. The only difference is, is that when you travel from California, you retain all of your credits, whereas if you travel from any of the other states, the credits in your account are reduced. Before we move on to the optional Section 170 state, 7 state compliance path, I just want to remind everyone one more time that starting in 2018, travel will only apply to credits earned from fuel cell electric vehicles. And to please report any questions that you have to the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. As part of the 2012 ZEV rulemaking, the board also adopted the optional 1 Section 77 state compliance path. This provision was designed to encourage manufacturers to place additional ZEVs in each of the Section 177 states prior to the start of the 2018 model year and to allow pooled, credit, pooled compliance across states. Large volume manufacturers and intermediate volume manufacturers that chose the optional Section 177 state compliance path before September 1, 2014 have an additional 0.75% ZEV requirement in model years 2016 and an additional 1.5% ZEV requirement in model year 2017 in each of the Section 177 states. These additional percentages cannot be met with travel credits and these requirements must be fulfilled by June 30th, 2018. So what is the advantage of all this? The advantage is that manufacturers get a relief on the portion of their ZEV requirement that may be met with TZEVs from model year 2015 through 2018, and relief on their ZEV-specific ZEV requirement from 2018 through 2020 in each of the Section 177 states. Additionally, manufacturers who took this path are also allowed to pool credits amongst the Section 177 states in order to meet their requirements. Manufacturers are allowed to pool credits until 2021 model year. Pooling will allow manufacturers to deliver vehicles in regions with the greatest demand and most developed infrastructure without having to worry about creating a compliance shortfall in other states. Let's look at an example of how this works. Pooling credits simply means that a manufacturer may transfer credits from one state bank to another state bank. There are actually two regional pools, the West Region Pool and the East Region Pool. And as you can see, California is not a part of either one. 
a manufacturer may pool credits within a regional pool without a penalty, but they face a 30% premium on any credits transferred between regions. This means that within the East Region Pool, a manufacturer could use credits from vehicles placed in New York to meet its dev requirement in Vermont without any penalty. If, however, that same manufacturer wanted to use credits earned in the East Region Pool to meet their ZEV requirement in Oregon, which is in the West Region Pool, they would have a 30% premium attached. For example, if the manufacturer needed to meet a compliance shortfall of 100 credits in Oregon with credits from New York, they would have to remove 130 credits from New York and they would earn 100 credits in Oregon. We will look at how a manufacturer's dev requirement changes as a result of choosing the optional Section 177 state compliance path next. Let's look at what effect choosing the optional Section 177 state compliance path will have on a manufacturer's individual state requirements. We begin with the existing minimum ZEV floor that a manufacturer must meet from 2015 through 2020, which is represented by the solid blue bars. We compare that with the minimum ZEV floor that a manufacturer will have in the Section 177 state as a result of choosing the optional compliance path represented by the spotted blue bars. We then see the existing percentages of a manufacturer's requirement that may be met with credits from TZEVs represented by solid green bars. And finally, the new percentages that may be met with credits from TZEVs represented by the spotted green bars. As a result of choosing the optional 1 Section 77 state compliance path and placing additional ZEVs in each of the Section 177 states prior to 2018 model year compliance, this manufacturer will have the percentage of the requirement that may be met with TZEVs reduced in model years 2015 through 2018 and their minimum ZEV floor reduced for 2018 through 2020 model year compliance. In addition, the manufacturer must produce additional ZEVs in model years 2016 and 2017 in each of the Section 177 states as a result of choosing the optional compliance path. As is often the case, there are additional flexibilities given to intermediate volume manufacturers. The total ZEV credit percentage requirement for model years 2015, 2016, and 2017 for inter is 14%. Intermediate volume manufacturers are allowed to meet a reduced ZEV percentage requirement of 12% in those model years, entirely with credits earned from partial zero emission vehicles, or PZEVs. IBMs that have chosen to participate in the optional Section 177 state compliance path prior to September 1, 2014, Will have, will have an additional reduction to their ZEV requirement for 2015 through 2017 model year compliance. The solid purple bars represent an intermediate volume manufacturer's ZEV percentage requirement in the Section 177 states for model years 2015 through 2017 prior to choosing the optional compliance path. The spotted purple bars represent the new reduced ZEV percentage requirement as a result of the optional compliance path. In addition, intermediate volume manufacturers will also have to produce additional fresh ZEV credit percentage, ZEV, ZEV credits in each of the Section 177 states, which you can see represented by the spotted red bars. There is an additional flexibility for IVMs who wish to participate in the optional Section 177 state compliance path, but who are not transitioning to large volume manufacturer status until after 2018 model year. For these OEMs, for those OEMs that will still be intermediate volume manufacturers in 2018 and beyond, they will have until September 1, 2016 to opt into the section to the optional Section 177 state compliance path. They will also be allowed to start pooling their 2012 and subsequent model year ZEV and TZEV credits in model year 2018, but they are not required to produce the additional fresh ZEVs until two years prior to transitioning to large volume manufacturer status. Keep in mind that starting in 2018 model year, in order to transition from an intermediate volume manufacturer to a large volume manufacturer, a manufacturer would need 
five consecutive three-year averages of over 20,000 vehicles. This means that the earliest an intermediate manu volume manufacturer could become a large volume manufacturer after 2018 model year would be 2023. The result is that these manufacturers will not be eligible for the reduced credit percentages in the 2018 through 2020 model years. I promise we are almost at the end, but before we, but before we are, we're going to cover demonstration of compliance and penalties associated with non-compliance. I just want to take a moment to remind you one last time to please submit any remaining questions to the chat box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Manufacturers subject to the regulation are to report their compliance data by May 1st after the end of the model year to all of the states, to most of the states. As an example, for compliance, in model year 2016, reports are due May 1, 2017. In Oregon, manufacturers will have until September 1st to report their data. Manufacturers also have a supplemental data reporting period from May 1st to September 1st, during which they may report data for vehicles placed between April 1st and June 30th. There are three states, Connecticut, Maine, and Rhode Island, which do not have this supplemental reporting period and all data is due by May 1st. Data is submitted to ARB via an online reporting tool. According to the California Exhaust Emissions and Test Procedures, Section D3, ARB is required to publicly disclose all compliance data following the end of each compliance year. This includes manufacturers' annual production data and credit balances for each vehicle type. This information is published annually on ARB's website under the Dev Program webpage in early October. Connecticut, Maine, and Rhode Island published this information in early June following their May 1st reporting deadline. Throughout this presentation, we have discussed all the ways in which a manufacturer may meet their ZEV requirements. Next, we will discuss the penalties that are associated with non-compliance with the regulation. Beginning in 2018 model year, should a manufacturer fail to meet the ZEV credit percentage requirements for a given model year, they must fulfill their deficit by the next model year. Intermediate volume manufacturers may apply to ARB's executive officer to request up to three consecutive model years to make up a credit deficit for any given model year. In order to qualify for this extension, the manufacturer must have delivered ZEVs or TZEVs within that model year, and they must submit a plan demonstrating how they will make up the credit deficit within the requested time period. Large volume manufacturers are required to use ZEV credits to fulfill a deficit, but intermediate volume manufacturers may use, ZEV, may use credits from ZEVs or TZEVs when meeting a deficit. Again, if the manufacturer cannot make up a deficit in the next model year, they will be subject to a penalty under the California Health and Safety Code, Section 43.211. Let me explain how this works in the next slide. Health and Safety Code 43.211 specifies that there is a $5,000 fine for each vehicle not produced. Starting in 2018 model year, the lowest number of credits that a ZEV can earn would be one per vehicle. As I stated earlier in the presentation, the, reg the regulation requires manufacturers to produce ZEVs. Therefore, one ZEV credit equals one vehicle for the purposes of penalties. Therefore, the manufacturer will incur a $5,000 penalty per each ZEV credit not produced. And this financial penalty is in addition to credits owed towards the deficit. This concludes our 2016 ZEV tutorial. I want to thank you all for participating today's, that a video of today's presentation will be made available on our ZEV program page within the next week or two. A link will be sent to your email when it is available. We now invite you to participate in our question and answer section session. Please submit all questions through the GoToWebinar chat window and remember to include the slide number in your question. We will not be reading your name or affiliation along with when answering our, your specific question. 
Also, please limit your questions to topics covered in this presentation. We will not be focusing on future regulatory actions or proposals for regulatory amendments during this session. Written responses will be posted for all questions along with the video of this presentation. Thank you again. Okay, question number one. What is the transition period for a manufacturer that is considered an IVM in 2017 model year and considered an LVM in 2018 model year and, and on? So as part of the regulatory amendments that were passed in 2012, I believe is when it, I believe is when it yeah. was introduced, um, the regulation is very clear that if you are an IVM in 2017, um, and you, uh, so the way the regulation actually works in uh, prior to 2018 model year compliance is that you are technically, if you exceed the sales volumes um, for an IVM, you are considered a large volume manufacturer the, the first year that your average goes above a sales volume of 60,000 vehicles. Um, and then you have five year lead time before you need to actually comply with large volume manufacturer requirements. However, within the regulation, it is very specific that it is five-year lead time or 2018, whichever comes first. So if, say, in 2017, your average production volume for the, the three previous consecutive model years was over 60,000, then you would be subject to the large volume manufacturer requirements in 2018 model year. Uh, I hope that's not too confusing. I know most of you are familiar with the regulation and the volume status requirements prior to 2018, um, but just know that if you're not familiar with it, um, prior to 2018, the cutoff point for intermediate to large volume is actually 60,000, not 20,000. Question number two. Will ARB make available specific OEM requirements and compliance data? If so, where will this be found? Um, I'll, I'll respond to that one. Uh, the, oh, this is Elise Ketty of the Air Resources Board, the implementation section. Um, we, the requirements are as laid out in our regulation regarding specific automaker requirements. We do not provide that um, in terms of compliance data as Ian presented during the tutorial. We do have a public disclosure page that provides account balances at a, on an annual basis. Um, if that is not the specific response you were looking for, please provide another follow-up question. We do, as Annalisa Bevan, our Assistant Division Chief, also pointed out, our public disclosure page also, pro also provides annual production data from the um, regulated parties, the automakers. Question number three. Regarding one of the conditions for IBM to LBM, the global revenue, does it mean the profit from the whole model year 18 vehicles or model year 19 vehicles or model year 20 vehicles? The requirements for the global revenue test are actually listed under the exhaust emissions and test procedures for 2018 and subsequent model year vehicles. Um, We'll provide a more specific link to that section within the, um, the written responses for the questions. Thank you. Is the BevX credit phasing out in 2018 and beyond? 
No, uh, BevX uh, vehicles will still be able to earn credits um, 2018 and beyond. The um, and they earn credits on the using the same equation that all BEVs use. Um, the only real difference is that the minimum range requirements for BEV are 50 mile AER, and for uh, BEVX it is a 75 mile AER. And um, and then in addition to that, any credits earned from the BEVXs are subject to the credit caps. Uh, which I went over on slide. I provided a nice chart for everyone, hopefully, um, which is on slide. Oh, here it is, slide 38. So I provided a, a nice chart for the credit caps for your um, future use. Will TISA requirements, such as the battery storage requirement, be extended to the 177 state? I'm, I'm not really sure what the what that what that questioner is is asking in terms of battery storage requirements. Are regulatory requirements that have been adopted by our Section 177 states are the same as as California's? So um, we can perhaps get a little more information about that question and respond to that in the Q and A yeah. after this yeah. webinar. For the purposes of the the uh, ZEM regulation. The only battery requirements for TZEVs are that they have a 10-year, 150,000-mile extended warranty. So, um, oh, I just I just realized the questioner may be asking. Uh, it may have to do with there are some some Section 177 states that in fact are not have opted out of the extended warranty requirements for. The ZEV regulation. There are a few states, so it may be we'll we'll do our research on that and get back. I know that not every Section 177 state has adopted the extended warranty requirements. For the GHG and ZEV overcompliance, is that taking into account the GHG off? Uh, that is beyond, okay. And, uh, so it does not take into account GHG off-cycle credits. So you base your target values entirely on each of the individual um, models that are within a manufacturer's, that a manufacturer is offering based on the vehicle type and footprint, and then you calculate all of the actual emission value from all of those vehicles. So uh, it does not take into account off-cycle credits. Thank you. How is the three-year average sales calculated for a manufacturer that begins selling in California in 2018? Uh, this is Chris at Ely, uh, implementation section. Um, while you guys were still doing the presentation, I, I looked up the answer to this. <laughs> in 1900, it uh, defines a, you know, talks about a small volume manufacturer. And so it's based on projected sales for your first year of certification here in California. So it's projected sales. Thank you, Krista. Will ARB disclose either total GHG over compliance credits or manufacturer level GHG credits as part of the credit bank disclosure? That's an excellent question. And our um, Disclosure piece in 1962.2 and the test procedures does not factor in disclosing GHG over compliance. So I believe that that is, that is the way it will be addressed. My, my sense on that is that uh, this is Annalisa Bevan. Um, we wouldn't because they're not tradable. Um, they, yeah, they don't. Uh, yeah, they're 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 not a banked and tradable credit in the same sense that other credit types are. Can you explain in some detail the rationale for basing ZEV credits on vehicle range? If an automaker is able to sell ZEVs with lower range to a market segment. Why do they deserve fewer credits? 
if more range comes at the expense of higher battery capacity, more credits would not necessarily incite tech innovation. If more range is the result of battery better efficiency, that would be tech innovation. But this could be incited with credits based on range per kilowatt hour. Uh, this question actually is, has been covered extensively in the staff report associated with our our rulemaking back, the staff report was released in December 2011 for our 2012 rulemaking. Uh, the questioner is welcome to follow up with us on that. We can certainly address this a little bit in a, in a written response in our Q&A. Could you please uh, repeat the difference between a traveling credit from California and from other states. Absolutely. So um, what I was trying to get at here is, again, there's a lot of misconceptions about travel and how it works. And so um, one of the things that, um, that you come to realize is that you can sort of think of it as you're always traveling the credits through California's bank is, is kind of a way of thinking of it. And so the difference between, you know, in California, when you travel, in, in this uh, example I had, I said that you had 1,000 vehicles earning 4,000 credits. If you earn those in California and you decided to travel all 4,000 credits, your California bank would retain those 4,000 credits. And then you would earn the additional credits in each of the, the states I had in the example based on the proportional value. The difference with uh, earning those 4,000 credits in, in the example I had, state B, which had a 50% production volume from California, when you decide to travel them, you would no longer have 4,000 credits in state B. They would be reduced by half because they have a 50% proportional value. So instead of 4,000 credits in state B, you would end up with 2,000 credits in state B. Now, you would still earn 4,000 credits in California, 3,000 credits in state A, 2,000 credits in state B, and 1,000 credits in state C. So again, I just wanted to point out this idea that when you travel them, uh, the credits, because it's all based on the proportional value of the individual states to California, and that is specific to the model year, and um, specific to the model year, that the credits all kind of travel, it, it, you can think of it as traveling through California, if that's a little bit easier. Maybe another way of thinking about this is, is rather than thinking of them as traveling, it's sort of copying across the different banks through a filter located in California um, and proportioned to that state's sales relative to California. Will the ZEV credit system calculate these various ZEV credit options? We're all looking at each other for the response, but I'll give it. Yes. The answer is yes. 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 We are um, reporting tool does calculate all of these reporting options. Uh, are small volume ZEV manufacturers or TZEV, uh, BEV, et cetera, able to sell or get ZEV credits that can be sold to other companies? Yes. A small volume manufacturer um, that produces uh, that produces vehicles that are eligible under our regulation, uh, as long as they are uh, certified uh, to be sold in California by ARB's certification staff, um, they can then um, submit to earn credits and they can be traded and sold. Are aftermarket ZEV converters able to get ZEV credits that can be sold to other companies? No, they are not. This is the um, ZEV requirement and the ZEV flexibilities are subject to uh, auto manufacturers. Aftermarket convert, conversions are not eligible for earning ZEV credits. If, if an aftermarket converter certifies that vehicle as a new vehicle, meaning that they get the car, the chassis, um, uh, and certify it as new, um, can't be previously owned or used, then that would be an exception to that situation. Just a reminder, the webinar recording will be posted as well as the slides and any unanswered questions on the ZEV program page and an email notification will go out at the time of posting. Will the travel precision loophole end as of January 1, 2018 
or model year 2018? Uh, so the slides that we covered today um, cover 2018 and subsequent model year debt regulation requirements. So, um, so when we're talking about the travel provision, we're talking about it continuing for 2018 and beyond. However, I must be clear, as I think I stated three times in the slide, the travel provision will no longer be applicable to credits earned from BEVs. Only credits that have been earned on fuel cell electric vehicles will be allowed to travel from model year 2018 and beyond, and credits earned from ZEVs will no longer be allowed to travel model year 2018 and beyond. But it is a model year specific, as opposed to calendar year provision. That, yes, correct. We can verify <coughs> that. We can, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get back on that, but that's my perception. <laughs> How is revenue defined for the intermediate to large volume manufacturer transition rules? Uh, again, we'll post a specific link to the section within the test procedures that it's defined. Um, I, think, I think we might have mentioned that earlier, um, but uh, yeah, it's defined within the exhaust emission and test procedures. There's actually a call out for how that's calculated. Can an OEM opt out of the optional S-177 state compliance path even if he has chosen that path? Yes. Yes, they'll be subject to the they opted in, so they may they may opt they may step off of that path and be subject to standard requirements. Paying the ZEV penalty will not allow a pathway to compliance by itself. That's, uh, that's not that's not so the way that um, the penalty works is that the penalty is in addition to um, the financial penalty is in addition to any credits owed towards the, the deficit. The manufacturer would still be required to uh, to submit credits uh, commensurate to the, the deficit, but they would also be subject to the financial penalty. So again, to be clear, a manufacturer has compliance obligations. If they don't meet them, they are penalized. That does not absolve their, they must that does not absolve their um, compliance obligation. They must still meet that obligation. It's just they receive a civil penalty or a, a failure penalty on top of that. Are advanced technology demonstration program credits open to LVM, IVM, and SVM? They are open to manufacturers with an obligation in this regulation. So that would be that would mean large volume manufacturers and intermediate volume manufacturers. Small volume manufacturers do not have a ZEV requirement, so they would not be eligible to earn credits using this flexibility. What happens if a manufacturer does not proceed with the production of fuel cell vehicles owing to a non-competitive cost structure? How does such a decision affect the ZEV requirement? Uh, so one of the things that I um, one of the things that I really wanted to stress in covering um, in covering this topic was this idea that the, the ZEV regulation, you know, at its at its heart, you know, I started out with this slide, and, and maybe I should have gone back to it, um, but uh, the ZEV regulation at its heart you know, sets these requirements and then it allows manufacturers great flexibility in how they choose to meet them. So um, I can't speak specifically to manufacturers' decisions in how they um, choose to meet their requirement. Um, what I can say is that, you know, we believe that there are sufficient flexibilities for meeting their requirements. Could a non plug-in hybrid electric vehicle qualify for TZEV? Unless it was a, a heist vehicle. So um, hybrid, um, or sorry, hydrogen internal combustion engine vehicles technically are, they earn credits under TZEV, um, if everybody remembers or is familiar with the current regulations, um, all of that kind of exists under the allowances. Um, and so, uh, and we kind of moved the highest vehicles in with the TZEVs, the TZEV the requirements. So um, they earn that, you know, a heist would earn the 0 0.75 base, and then via the, the zero emission VMT TZEV allowance, 
they can earn the additional credits if they were plug-in. But no, a non-plug-in hybrid electric vehicle could not earn credits under the um, zero emission VMT TZ allowance. Are there any battery warranty requirements for ZEV and BEV Xs similar to the 10-year, 150,000 mile for TZEV vehicle batteries? There are no, in the rig, there are currently no battery warranty requirements for ZEV. I'm actually looking to Ian regarding BEV X. If I, I do not recall if BEV X has a has a warrant, is subject to a warranty requirement. The BevXs, I believe, because they fall under the same TZ requirements um, for their, um, they fall under the same requirements as TZs do for their um, extended warranties, which does say that it has to be on the, uh, the traction battery. So I believe BevXs would be, it would be applicable, but for uh, Zs, it is not. So there's no warranty for Zs. In 2018 plus, can BevX credits be applied to the minimum ZEV requirement? If so, how is this possible given the vehicles have emissions? So Bev, uh, credits earned from BevXs can be used toward the minimum ZEV requirement or the minimum ZEV floor. Um, the way that we account for the fact that they are not, you know, uh, that's a good point that um, we define a ZEV as any vehicle that produces, uh, that produces no um, emissions um, under criteria pollutant or GHG emissions under any and all possible circumstances. Um, so the way that we account for this is by having that uh, limitation on the that credit cap. So you can only use your credits earned from BevXs to meet 50% of your minimum ZEV floor. And then there's no restriction on how they can be used to meet your TZEV requirement since they kind of act as TZEVs in that manner. What weight classes are being applied to the medium duty classification? Medium duty is 8,500 or above. I believe, the upper, I believe the upper limit is 14,000. 14, yeah. yeah. So, be, so really, our our factor is if it can, if it can, if the vehicle can be certified on a chassis dyno. Um, that is not a heavy-duty chassis dyno. It is eligible for earning ZEV credits. It has to do with the test procedures. And medium-duty ZEVs can earn, they can earn ZEV credits. Correct, as long as they go through that chassis certification. Yep. And the, the same certification process that light-duty vehicles do. What happens to P ZEV credits after 2018? Can they be used for ZEV or PZEV requirements? Yeah, I just put away the slide that has the answer to that to show it to you. But um, so yes, the PZEV credits are reduced, um, uh, and this is actually listed under 1962.1, the current um, ZEV regulation that takes us through 2017 model year compliance. So uh, at the end of model year 2017 compliance, uh, PZEV and ATPZEV credits will be discounted. Um, and then um, those credits will be for an intermediate volume manufacturer. Those credits um, are lumped in with credits from uh, NEV, Neighborhood Electric Vehicles. They may be used to meet 100% of an intermediate volume manufacturer's requirement for 2018 through 2019, and then only 25% of a manufacturer's uh, requirement that may be met with PZEVs 2020 through 2025. For a large volume manufacturer, uh, those credits will only ever be allowed to meet uh, up to 25% of their requirements that may be met with TZEVs or credits from TZEVs for 2018 through 2025 model year compliance. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, and again, one of my intentions on making um, this slide was to provide everybody with a very handy kind of uh, worksheet that you can hopefully print out, put on your desk, and look at it whenever you have a question. Help you guys out. Um, is there any other questions? Um, please submit them in the question box on the webinar window. Also, just as a quick reminder, the webinar recording as well as the slides and any unanswered questions will be posted on the ZEV program page. 
in a week or so, and an email reminder will be going out as soon as they are posted. For, the, for those of you who have submitted questions that we haven't responded to as part of this live webinar, uh, part of that is there are repetitions of earlier questions, and also some of them require additional, additional research, and, and it's appropriate to respond to those in writing. When will the 2025 multi year plus requirements be discussed? Actually, they were discussed in this in this um, yes. presentation because the regulation, uh, the the requirements beyond 2025 are actually in our 2018 and subsequent model year requirements. If you're speaking of any future regulatory development, uh, we're not we're not addressing that in this time. But you know, the, the, in terms of regulatory requirements, they're already in place in our current regulatory structure. Uh, beyond 2025, the requirements are as 2025. Well, thank you very much for joining us for our ZEV tutorial. Um, again, you will be getting an email regarding the posting of the recording, the slides, and any and all questions that we received. Uh, please direct any questions to the webinar link. And we hope you enjoyed the tutorial webinar. Thank you very much.